Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the United Nations Security Council, and specifically membership on the Security Council. This, of course, begins our unit on the United Nations as a whole. The UN is likely the most important of all international organizations, so it's worth studying. And as some proof of that, there's a good chance you're familiar with the building that the United Nations is headquartered in. That's the tall one with lots of blue windows on your screen there. You can't say that about very many international organizations. But this United Nations building has so much important history behind it, where so much diplomacy takes place, that you see it often both in the news and in political thrillers on television and in movies. So with that in mind, let's talk about what actually takes place in this building in New York City. The UN itself is divided into a large number of sub-organizations. And because the UN is effectively the governing body of the world, there are lots of other international organizations that have ties to the United Nations, even if those organizations do not fall under the direct purview of the UN. That being said, the two most important parts of the UN are the Security Council and the General Assembly. And just like the outer building, you're probably familiar with the interiors of these two parts. This is the inside of the General Assembly. The General Assembly consists of all countries within the United Nations. So when you see big speeches geared toward the entire international community, it's usually taking place at the front of this stage, with the ambassadors to the UN from the various countries sitting in the audience. The General Assembly has some important bureaucratic powers, and we'll talk about those later on in this course. What the General Assembly does not have, however, is the power to create binding resolutions. As a result, within international law, as well as within the United Nations itself, the General Assembly is by and large inferior to the Security Council. Nevertheless, because they pass resolutions anyway, and all countries vote on them, the United Nations General Assembly is useful for gathering data on where countries fall in the realm of international organization. And we'll talk about that as well later on in this course. Nevertheless, we're going to be focusing more on the Security Council within this unit. And again, we have an interior room that you're likely already familiar with. This famous horseshoe desk is the chambers of the Security Council. This is the room where a select few countries meet to discuss important security matters and also pass binding resolutions. So who are those members? Well, we have 15 overall, five of whom are permanent. We have the United States, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom. These countries are always on the Security Council. They're on there right now. They've been there 10 years ago. They will be 10 years from now. They do not cycle off. They're also different from other states insofar as they have veto power on resolutions, a topic we'll approach again later in this unit. They are permanent members because they were the winners of World War II, or at least in the case of Russia, the predecessor state, the Soviet Union, was a winner of World War II. If you think about how the United Nations was founded, it was created in the aftermath of World War II. And so you can imagine that if you were the winner of the war, and therefore capable of setting how the international agenda was going to run, you would want to put yourself in a privileged position. And that's exactly what happened with those five countries. The remaining 10 members of the Security Council are non-permanent. They serve two-year terms, and they cannot be elected in back-to-back -back terms. So if you serve for two years, you got to take some time off. As I record this, those 10 members are Niger, Tunisia, Vietnam, Estonia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Kenya, India, Mexico, Norway, and Ireland. The terms are staggered such that the top five countries will be falling off next year and replaced. And then the year after that, the bottom five countries will be falling off and then replaced. 
you might have noticed that there is good regional diversity within the non-permanent membership. And that's not a coincidence. There's actually a regional quota system. This map shows you what those regions are and how many seats each region is allotted. Africa always has three non-permanent members. Latin America always has two. Eastern Europe always has one. Asia always has two. And finally, the catch-all remaining group, Western European and Others group, that's the actual name of it, W-E-O-G, they have two. And it actually gets weirder than that. The Western European and Others group can claim full continental representation other than Antarctica. Obviously, North America, Europe, and Australia are covered. South America is covered via French Guiana, which is a full-fledged part of France. Africa is covered because Spain controls a few small parts of what is along Morocco. And Asia is covered in a couple of ways. Most of Turkey falls within Asia. And in addition to that, Israel, although you can't quite see it here, is also within the Western European and others group. That's because the groups that they are more regionally closer to don't follow their politics as closely as the Western European and others group does. In addition to those regional groups, there's also an informal rule called the Arab Swing State. At all times, one Arabic country will be on the Security Council via non-permanent membership. Sometimes it will be through the African region, and sometimes it will be through the Asian region. But regardless, at all times, there's at least one Arabic state on the Security Council. Although there is good regional representation within the non-permanent membership, overall membership within the Security Council is not proportionally distributed across states. The Western European and Others group has a fairly small number of countries overall. Nevertheless, they have five members on the Security Council at all times. That's because the United States, the United Kingdom, and France are permanent members. On the flip side, the largest groups by number of countries are Africa and Asia. Nevertheless, they only have three countries at all times. So that's the makeup of the Security Council. But how do you actually get on there as a non-permanent member? Well, it's a two-step process. Nominees come from regional groups, but then require a two-thirds supermajority approval from the General Assembly to get to that two-year term as a non-permanent member. For example, Mexico is currently a non-permanent member. To get there, it first had to convince its Latin American group to nominate it to be a non-permanent member. And then once that nomination came up, two-thirds of the General Assembly had to vote yes for Mexico to make it. What's interesting about this nomination process is that we usually only see one nominee per open slot. So if your regional group has two open slots this year, then your regional group is probably only going to have two nominees. And thus, when it gets to the General Assembly, the two-thirds approval tends to be a rubber stamp. Those two countries go on and become members of the Security Council for that two-year term. It is rare for there to be a competitive election within the General Assembly. Sometimes it happens, but very rarely. What that means is that the real competition occurs within the regional groups. And unfortunately, that process is opaque. So we as researchers don't have a very good idea about how a country becomes the nominee and then, with any luck for that country, receives the rubber stamp from the General Assembly. What we do observe, though, is lots of effort from states to try to drive competitors out of upcoming elections. Here's an example of that. Back in 2014, Uruguay wanted to have the 2016 to 2017 Latin American slot. They were campaigning for it. Armenia came out with a public declaration saying that they support Uruguay's candidacy here. Now, in some sense, this is strange. Armenia is not a member of the Latin American group, and so they don't have any ability to force through that nomination. But at least it's sensible insofar as Uruguay is campaigning for something that is going to be coming up soon, 
This was 2014, and this was the 2016 to 2017 non-permanent membership. Here's where things get wonky. In return for Armenia's support, Uruguay threw its support behind Armenia's candidacy. But this was not an eminent election. Instead, Armenia was trying to secure a slot for the 2032 to 2033 non-permanent membership. That's almost 20 years after this declaration. What's happening here is that Armenia is trying to clear the field of 2032 to 2033. If no other country from Eastern Europe tries to get that slot, then the Eastern European group is going to be forced to nominate Armenia. And if Armenia is the only one nominated, then conceivably it will receive the rubber stamp from the General Assembly and it will get on the Security Council. By the way, this relationship turned out well for Uruguay. Uruguay got the slot they had hoped for. We're still a long way away from Armenia's chance, so if you're watching this video in the future, please go ahead and leave a note behind to see if Armenia has been successful. To be clear, Armenia is not the only one that does this. Here we have Belgium declaring its candidacy for a seventh rotation within the non-permanent membership, this time in 2037 to 2038. And if you look at the bottom, that was published in 2021. That's when Belgium declared this. 16 years before when they'd actually be getting onto the Security Council, they're already trying to clear the field and guarantee themselves that slot. If Belgium has been on there six times before, you may wonder where they rank among the most. And Belgium is pretty high, but they are not the highest. Japan is the most frequent non-permanent member on the Security Council, having served 11 times. Brazil is next at 10, Argentina at 9, India at 8, Colombia, Italy, and Pakistan at 7, and then Belgium, Canada, West Germany, and current Germany combined together at 6, as well as Poland also at 6. On the other hand, not every country has served on the Security Council. Each country shaded in gray has not even been on the Security Council for a single year. One notable part about that map is that Saudi Arabia is shaded in. But unlike the rest of the countries, Saudi Arabia has actually won an election to become a member on the Security Council. In 2013, they ran unopposed. But rather than accept the slot, Saudi Arabia withdrew its name in protest to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. To wrap things up, we know that we have 15 countries on the Security Council. What we haven't yet talked about are the voting rules on the Security Council. What are the resolutions that the Security Council passes? And how does the central enforcement problem that is rampant in all of international relations affect what might happen with those voting procedures? Well, those are going to be topics for this unit. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.